Logos. What are logos? Logos are the visual identifiers between us and the brands. From fruit-based electronic companies to soft drink companies who refuse to pay out for a private jet. Everything's connected. Millions of dollars have been spent on finding the right logo, the perfect fit for the perfect brand. The golden arches are the cornerstone of the fast food industry. This tick means sportswear. And this online shopping centre will get your product to you from A to Z, even if that means burning down its namesake in the process. They become ubiquitous household imagery, identifiable at a glance. From commerce, to media companies, to film and television. Star Wars, Star Trek and more. And Doctor Who recently got a new one. Shame it's a bit naff. Are they even human? There are so many Doctor Who logos. Depending on how you count it, there are 12 logos used in conjunction with televised Doctor Who, but there are numerous others. Some are abstractions of official logos used on merchandise, while others are clearly made up by a madman in a graphics laboratory, while others still are possibly better than their official counterparts. I mean, I could sit here and talk about how the Death Comes to Time logo is an intersection of the Diamond logo that somehow predicts the 2005 ellipse. Or how this logo from the American publications of Target Novelizations is baffling and gothic, yet commendable for attempting to invert the focus from who to doctor, while also wanting to suck your blood. But then we'd be here for hours, and I respect your time too much to labour such obvious points. When Doctor Who started in 1963, it premiered with a basic graphic sans serif typeface. It's safe to say that the show's theme tune was far more memorable than its initial logo. But in fairness, Doctor Who wasn't intended to become a multimedia phenomenon. At one stage, it was going to be axed after just 13 weeks. Also, massive media brands weren't really a thing back in the early 60s. Logos for film, and to a lesser extent television, were at best the byproduct of the title sequence in which they appeared. The works of Sol Bass were massively influential in this field. With The Man with the Golden Arm, North by Northwest, and Psycho, the animated graphics informed what the logo would become. In the case of Doctor Who, a combination of a bizarre feedback loop known as the Howlround effect and the aforementioned haunting electronic music from Delia Derbyshire and the Radiophonic Workshop created a hugely iconic sequence and opening staple for the show. I had a feeling that with all this uh, electronic effect happening, there was no point in making an elaborate piece of type as well. It needed something simple to generate. It was the, it was the whiteness of that block of type that generated this really weird sort of Rorschach uh, pattern. And that was it. Doctor Who's first logo. I use the word loosely here, as it clearly wasn't a fixed concept for the show. Just look at the books and related early ephemera of the day. The word Doctor is often presented as the abbreviated DR, possibly a side effect of the feature film in 1965. That said, a few early novelizations did attempt to replicate the logo as seen on screen. The original cover for Doctor Who in an exciting adventure with the Daleks has this beautiful interpretation of the logo. Also, this hot pink is choice. While not strictly accurate to the font from the show, this wordmark used in the publication of these early novelizations from Frederick Muller is cracking. It's a bold graphic, and this intangible effect on the word who to emulate the Howround effect is genius. In my opinion, it is the strongest logo associated with the franchise to have originated in the 60s. It wasn't until the advent of colour that Doctor Who got its first proper logo. Bernard Lodge designed this iconic graphic in 1970, and it is probably the logo that's been revisited the most. 
Despite having a short tenure on screen, it's had a lasting legacy. And it makes sense! It's a distinct wordmark in its own bold font, which works in any colour, on any background, stacked or unstacked, as a flat graphic or in Boscuomorphic 3D. For something designed in 1970, it genuinely feels ahead of its time. After only four years on screen, however, it was shelved in favour of something completely different. But we'll get back to that one, don't worry. By the time the 80s rolled around, family sci-fi fantasy had changed forever. The biggest boy in the playground had landed in theatres, and Doctor Who would start to struggle against its American counterparts. While the neon logo is in no way as timeless as the Star Wars logo, it feels like a distinct attempt to house the brand in a contemporary identity. It is clearly a product of the early 80s. It would only really work today if you leaned into the retro aesthetic, with costume, hair and music to fit. Kitsch would be my one word review, and I'll be honest, I'm not against the idea. <sighs> yeah. Then there's... Then there's this. Yeah. After the series was put on ice at the end of the 80s, Doctor Who fell into the custodianship of BBC Enterprises. And apart from the Virgin New Adventures, the Diamond logo was resurrected to represent the franchise. That was until 1996, when it was swapped out in favour of a slightly modernised version of the Pertwee logo, after having featured in that year's TV movie. Moving forward, the now cult franchise appeared to be unified under this iconic wordmark, featuring across the DVD range, the BBC books, my beloved Scream of the Schalke, the BBC Doctor Who website, and the soon-to-be-established Big Finish. Though, the less said about this ugly copper version for the first set of McGann stories, the better. With the return of the show in 2005, the BBC Wales graphics department were tasked with dragging Doctor Who's logo, kicking and screaming into the noughties. A lot of work went into creating a new identity for the franchise to suit the 21st century. This was the first logo to break with the tradition of stacking the Doctor and Who text in favour of a horizontal format, while also encasing the wordmark in an elliptical shape. Even though it would come to be affectionately, or not so affectionately, known as the Taxi logo by much of the fandom, the use of the shield meant this logo was probably the closest we had been to the Diamond logo since its retirement. It was striking, it was eye-catching, and it was clean. You'd pick out the magazine in WH Smith from a distance. It re-established the franchise and helped convey a lot of what the reboot was attempting to achieve. An eye opening up on the mysterious and fiery universe of the Doctor. Four years later, Russell T Davis stepped down as showrunner, never to return. A young, fresh-faced Stephen Moffat took the reins with the challenge of moving the show forward. 2010 saw a lot of changes from the top down. New cameras, new directors, a new TARDIS, and Morbius actor Matt Smith was cast as the new Doctor. With all of that came a new logo and the introduction of Doctor Who's first insignia. It's a TARDIS made up of the D and W from Doctor Who. It's probably the kitschiest thing about Stephen's tenure, and according to one of the designers in Doctor Who magazine, the insignia came first and the typeface followed. I actually like the DW insignia. It came along perfectly in time with social media, making it ideal for use as the brand's avatar on sites like Twitter and Facebook. The accompanying font, however, leaves a lot to be desired. Indeed, the BBC ran into issues with it pretty quickly, and this logo didn't remain unscathed for long, getting broken up and shifted about alongside increasingly daft textures before being fattened up for the entirety of the Capaldi years. Then, in 2018, the introduction of the Forever logo. No one ever called it that, by the way, that's just me. I call it the Forever logo. But it was clear that that was the intention. 
This sleek, fresh wordmark and new Who insignia were quickly covering all Doctor Who merchandise. And I mean all. Books, comics, toys and shock, horror, indignation. Classic Doctor Who, from the collection box sets to Big Finish. That was until the 25th of October 2022, when everything would change again. And you may ask yourself, how did I get here? So, to recap. In 2018, then incoming showrunner and Coco Rocks fiend Chris Chibnall and Friends oversaw a new logo redesign. By this point, a new logo was kind of expected. RTD and Stephen Moffat both had unique wordmarks to represent their ten years. But the 2018 logo overhaul was far greater reaching than just modern Who. From the very next day, that logo was present across the brand. It was clear that an attempt was being made to unify the Doctor Who brand under one logo with a simple insignia. Designed by the team at Friendly Giants, formerly Little Hawk, a lot of work had gone into creating an elegant yet sustainable logo that was scalable for marketing campaigns and utility across the brand. You might remember a plucky young Hootuber waxing lyrical about the redesign not long after it happened. I wonder what happened to him. But here we are in 2023, and that logo has already been superseded. In fact, it didn't even last five years. Not even 48 hours after Jodie Whittaker's finale, a new logo was revealed at a press release heralding an exciting future for the show. Why was the Little Hawk logo abandoned so unceremoniously? Why did Doctor Who's evergreen brand strategy never quite come to fruition? Was it a mistake to try and create a brand-defining logo 55 years into a franchise's lifespan? To answer that last part first, no? I personally don't think so. And clearly, that's still the way the franchise intends to use the current logo, already being used on Big Finish, books and other merchandise. Comically, the now well-established Doctor Who collection box sets are going to continue using the 2018 logo, while the rest of the franchise is using the throwback Diamond one. Other media franchises have distinct logos that they've stuck with, Star Wars being an obvious example. The biggest sci-fi fantasy franchise on the planet, even if it's only ever had one good movie, has had the same logo since A New Hope in 1977. It works stacked, it works horizontally, it's a unique wordmark that has successfully translated across films, books, comics, games, toys and, more recently, TV. Following some experimentation in the 80s and 90s, Star Trek has returned to its original logo, proving to have great versatility and variety. These word marks and others become staples in the brain. We see them across the store, or on posters, in public, or in private, in print, or on phone screens. They are a distinct shorthand associated with the things we like, or things we don't like that we recognise without even reading the words that make them up. Frankly, by 2018 it was kind of mad that Doctor Who didn't have an umbrella branding strategy in place, except it kind of did. Ever since the TV movie in 1996, the second iteration of Bernard Lodge's Pertwee logo, which as far as I can tell first appeared on the cover of the making of Doctor Who, had become the de facto logo for the brand. When the new series came about in 2005, a concerted effort was made to keep the two separate. The 2005 taxicab logo was for New Who, and the Pertwee McGann logo encompassed Classic Who. And this worked fine for a while, until the 50th anniversary year, at which stage products were produced with seemingly random choice between the then current Doctor Who DW logo or this classic logo, culminating in the 50th anniversary special The Day of the Doctor not utilising either, in favour of the original logo from 1963. So, by 2018, the brand was a little confused. 
The 50th might have been a better time to unify the classic and new Who series under one logo, but instead the brand bumbled on for another four years before the Chibnall era began. I guess it was decided that a new, modern logo would work better moving forward than unifying under the old 70s logo, and I can understand that. You're trying to put out a message that the show is new and modern. Also, it's not like you can't see influences from the Perwe McGann logo in the 2018 one, which also felt like it was taking a little bit of inspiration from the McCoy logo of all places. It seems from early on, however, the logo did cause some headaches for designers working on brand material. It was deemed too thin and, when surrounded by complex or busy cover art, it could get lost. This is a fair problem, especially if you want your franchise to stand out in store shelves. While eventually it seems that these misgivings were solved for the most part, I feel like some of the solutions, especially on the toy range, were pretty dire. We ended up with this Cadbury's royal blue packaging adorned with the weaker stacked logo resembling kitchenware. It doesn't scream adventures in space and time, it's dull as dishwater. And what happened to the far more vibrant, colourful stuff we saw early in the Whittaker era? In a recent interview with Radio Free Scaro, Chris Chibnall gives us an insight into what happened. And um, Yeah, I think the brand manager, it, we had someone lined up to be a brand executive, a brand president um, when uh, we had somebody amazing and, and um, when I took the job on, or just after I took the job on, and then they were, they didn't, it didn't get over the line. So the, the oh, approach really? was going to be very, very different and um, uh, would have been fantastic, but they couldn't, the, the studios couldn't get the, mm -hmm. the deal done in the end. Um, yeah. So it's like, you know, it, you're working in the real world. And yeah, I know it's yeah. like, and as yeah. fans, you just go, why aren't they doing this or why are they doing this? It's like, it's, it's not like people haven't thought about it or aren't trying or don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. It's like you are working against um, Warner's. Mm -hmm. And HBO, and you know uh, the Wizarding World, yeah. and you know all these kind of which are unbelievably resourced. You know, yeah. That says to me that the branding strategy for the Chibnall era was meant to be quite different, and the logo reveal in early 2018 was the start of that. However, when this brand executive fell through, BBC Studios were left to pick up the pieces and fumble forward while the BBC in the UK would handle a somewhat lacklustre ad campaign with diminishing returns year on year. It's worth listening to that full interview for greater context, by the way. Link in the description. Also, it's worth pointing out it's not like the ad campaigns done by BBC Studios were a complete failure. They won awards for their work advertising Flux, for example. But I feel like we never saw the true potential that was associated with that logo and branding. The resulting haphazard use of the logo in the following few years, the show's stop-start production, the lack of exposure, and the perceived fall in general interest, plus its association with some awkward transmedia productions, led to what was a strong attempt at a brand-encompassing logo, becoming a logo which, to the public's eye, encompassed all that was a failure about Doctor Who. True or not, unfortunately, the general public's perception of these things is what ultimately needs to be considered. The BBC are selling it to them, not to us, the fans. And especially in the UK, where tabloid newspapers can sway public consensus on subjects to increasingly dangerous levels. While the logo might have been salvageable, maybe making it a little thicker to stand out more, it ultimately seemed inevitable that when a new showrunner arrived, a brand overhaul would be forthcoming. So, here we are, the return of the Diamond logo, lauded by fans new and old as a return to form, with many heart-eyed emojis declaring how good it looks. Unfortunately for me, the Diamond logo looks really, really Goofy. Is it even called the diamond logo? I mean, I know why, but this shape is technically a rhombus. Normalize calling it the rhombus logo. So let's look back to 1973, when this logo first made an appearance. 
Bernard Lodge was a designer and animator at the BBC. He'd been responsible for the creation of each previous title sequence, and was asked by then-producer Barry Letts to overhaul the sequence again. This time, the show looked to modernising away from the classic HowlRound effect as it entered its teen years. Lodge took inspiration from the groundbreaking visual effects pioneered by Douglas Trumbull in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Trumbull, himself inspired by colleague and animator John Whitney's experiments with light and shutter speed variation, developed a new animated slit scan technique whereby light was cast through a mask as a camera on a track took a long exposure. I won't go into the particulars here, but check out the video in the card if you're interested. Long story short, Lodge was able to take simple silhouettes of shapes, or John Pertwee's, and use them to generate slit scan tunnels of abstract light and motion. TARDIS tunnels from TARDIS stencils, circular tunnels from circular stencils, and diamond tunnels from diamond stencils. This would ultimately define the shape of the logo. I think it was probably because I was doing this diamond shaped tunnel that the idea of a diamond shaped, pretty well diamond shaped logo uh, would work down there. Now this is where it gets controversial because I personally don't believe the logo created anything particularly special or even timeless. But I do believe that this is a proper piece of timeless, iconic animation. <laughs> diamond shape travelling down a diamond tunnel. The marriage of that shape, motion and visual iconography playing for seven consecutive years on one of the country's most popular shows is of course going to leave an impact. Even when it comes to reruns worldwide, by virtue of the sheer volume of episodes in which it appears, it's going to become ubiquitous with the programme and quote unquote iconic. From my perspective, the logo is only iconic by association. It really is just the satisfaction of a square peg going in the square hole. As for the features of the logo, without that context, well, it's ugly in a uniquely British way. Let's begin with the Doctor Who lettering, or typography. This typeface is good, if a little early 70s, it appears to be Futura Bold, or at least based on Bold and Extra Bold. It's a strong, legible font. The Who is super bold and clearly the centre of this design. Interestingly, it appears the characters of this typeface might actually be an original design by Bernard Lodge. I've not been able to find anything that resembles it. The effect is super 70s, but clear and recognisable. The Doctor being encased in an art shape is an oddity, but it is an inventive use of the space above Who, as well as being a different approach to the standard stacking of the text that had been the norm to this point. However, and this is where it starts to get a bit weird, the use of an arched plate itself is strangely reminiscent of early 20th century industrial nameplates. Uh, you might have seen them on a steam locomotive. Maybe that's just me. But the industrial association continues, as it also puts me in mind of Wallace and Gromit and Fred Dibner. It wouldn't look out of place in the same fit and finish as the logo on this DVD. Who is this guy, by the way? Is that what Lodge was going for? A somewhat Victorian, brutalist industrial design? Doesn't exactly scream sci-fi whimsical adventure to me, but it's certainly unique. Meanwhile, acclaimed graphic designer Ryan Hughes said in Doctor Who magazine that for him, it looks like a hove is bred. If we're moving to the kitchen, might I suggest a Bailey's? The letters of Doctor, the outline of its nameplate and the word Who all being highlighted in white is a very smart move. The logo, as designed for television, appears in a royal blue gradient. It actually shimmers as it travels down the tunnel. So these important elements being picked out in white mean audiences can pick out and read the text quickly and clearly. You have to remember that when this sequence was created, 
Not only would it be on the modern Color 4.3 televisions of the era, but also on black and white TVs as small as postage stamps. Clarity is king, just as much then as it is now. So what of this diamond shape, the logo's shield, if you will? This logo is often described as Art Deco, or even possibly Art Nouveau in nature, and that association is clearly visible on the shield. The diamond has a further two diamonds within itself, picked out in a fixed width piping. Then at the bottom of the diamond you have this design flourish. And I assume this is meant to emulate the aberrations and patterns that make up the complexity of Art Deco design. It's clearly placed here to fill the void that would otherwise be noticeable. Uh, as a kid, however, I always thought these shapes looked like random hills. Sorry, uh, can you elaborate on that, John? No. Is it really worth mentioning in this video? Uh, yes. I think it looks like hills. <sighs> okay. So, a bit unusual, but it helps fill the space. Also, using art shapes there help reflect the other rounded shapes in the upper two thirds of the logo. The space under the word Who has been used inventively in the many years since. When Doctor Who Weekly came along in 1979, it mirrored the nameplate from above for the Weekly. And when the show celebrated its 30th anniversary in 1993, a ribbon declaring as much was placed here. At some point during the 1970s, as merchandise for the show began to appear, someone somewhere decided, rightly, that the royal blue of the logo, as it appeared in the title sequence, needed a more colourful variant. Unfortunately, this was apparently achieved by dropping the logo into a Christmas card factory. Bertha, lovely Bertha, you are a lovely machine, and anyone who works with you will know just what I mean. I understand wanting to make the logo pop more in a print medium, but why this seemingly random assortment of colours? Is this tri complementary? No. These colour choices are the work of a lunatic. It pushes the design further away from being perceived as Art Deco and more into the realms of Clown College. People look at this and say it's a classic logo. It's hideous! Anyway, it might look goofy to me. But its longevity on screen and use on important ephemera over five decades has assured its place as part of the cultural zeitgeist. So that's the original 1973 Bernard Lodge diamond logo, text reminiscent of industrial Britain and assured that sort of looks like it might be Art Deco inspired, blended together rough and smooth. I could sit here for hours and muse deeper into this rabbit hole, but I still haven't got to the new logo yet, and I claimed to respect your time. Finally, we've laid the groundwork. The history of Doctor Who's logos and the original Diamond logo. Now, it's time to talk about the new logo. And here it is! <laughs> Oh, oh, uh, this is embarrassing. Uh, they've mistakenly put a graphic from a fan film here. <laughs> what japes? As if they'd make the new logo so ugly and cumbersome. It looks like a PS1 graphic. Oh, I know. The real logo is hiding underneath. Let me just move it. Ah, uh, hmm. Maybe it's under... Ha, <laughs> ha, you're not serious. Are you seriously saying that? that this is the new logo? Um... Uh, oh... Oh no... Ah! Seriously? What is this? Why is it so ugly? What's with the colour and texture choices here? Why is it even 3D in the first place? What is this? Doctor Who Night on BBC Two? I get that you want the Doctor Who logo to be bold and exciting, but that doesn't need to come at the expense of a low quality render. So it's blue, I guess because the TARDIS is blue? Okay, except the TARDIS is not that shade of blue, like at all. It's closer to a turquoise earthy blue, depending on what light you catch it in. It's never really been a shiny metallic metropolitan blue. Also, it's so dimly lit with this awful directional lighting that the whole thing is just muddy. Sure, my eye is drawn to it, 
but it weighs my eye down. I didn't know a graphic could feel heavy, yet here we are. And what's with this awful beige glow around the word who? Whose idea was that? I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall that day. Honestly though, if the logo is blue to emulate the TARDIS, I think this yellow is meant to invoke the TARDIS windows? Let me just... Yeah, okay, I think that was the idea. Shame it looks like weak custard. If you want your logo to glow gold, make it glow gold, not this piss yellow. And, ugh, what's this? What's this visual noise here? I think I get it. The silver piping is reflecting on these extrusions. Did no one in the office take a step back and say, blimey, this is a bit visually distracting. All these reflections are creating a lot of visual noise here that distracts from the name of the franchise. And why is the word doctor so dimly lit from above? Why are we getting these ugly drop shadows here? It barely leaps off the arch plate at all. Oh, and the arch plate, it's 3D now. It looks even more like a steam engine's nameplate. Here's a little graphic design hack for you. If you put an E and an X next to each other, like say the FedEx logo, the negative space between them creates an arrow. It's a famous bit of graphic design. Well, it turns out that if you put a diamond around a capital H, it creates two arrows. One up and one down. Good luck on seeing that. Wonder what that represents. Maybe the ever fluctuating ratings that Doctor Who gets, or it's just a graphical coincidence. Either way, there you go, Radio Times, written a new clickbait article for you. And people seriously think this is the best logo New Who has ever had. It's the logo equivalent of the 12 Doctors Sonic Screwdriver. Garish, an eyesore, and impractical. Let's break down why. The overriding issue I have with this logo is this render. The logo is skeuomorphic. What's skeuomorphism, I don't hear you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you, as clearly, I don't respect your time. The most common example given is its use on early smartphone interfaces. You have a book app? Well, let's make it look like your collection is on an actual bookshelf. The camera app? Let's animate the shutter closing and play a camera sound when you take a picture. Does anyone remember the old iOS podcast app? It used to look like a cassette tape player, and you could see the reel animate from side to side. Completely superfluous, of course, but I loved it. Skewomorphism has become a bit of a dirty word in the design world over the last 10 to 15 years, because it's seen as cluttered and dated. But logos for media companies and franchises get big, gleaming, CGI-generated graphics, usually textured to mimic some form of brushed steel to make it seem big and powerful. Marvel has this really iconic flat logo, but when you used to see Marvel movies, they were preceded by the overindulgent 27-minute Marvel Studios ident, with the logo made to look like embossed, crafted and brushed steel. I don't think skewomorphism is inherently bad. Personally, I prefer nice flat graphics and bold colours, but when you have media properties that are bold as brass and vying for attention, it makes sense that you'd make your logo 3D. The point I'm making here is, making this logo 3D does make sense. It's bold and a little bombastic, and really, I shouldn't have expected different from Russell. These weren't exactly understated, were they? And it's not like previous New Who logos haven't been designed flat and then given a skewomorphic transformation in the opening titles. No, my issue here is purely one of visual finesse. Doctor Who is on the edge of a very exciting time, with a very promising future ahead. Yet the vanguard of that change is not only a swing at the nostalgic heartstrings, but one that looks ugly. This isn't to say that choosing the diamond logo for the 60th and beyond was inherently a mistake. It's not like other franchises, as mentioned, don't go back to the well from time to time. Also, presumably, the Pertwee McGann logo, while definitely superior, wasn't considered due to it only recently being retired. So, which other logo from the classic series really holds the same kind of cultural impact that those two 70s logos do? Can you imagine if RTD2 just used the Troughton logo instead? 
I know I've been pretty hard on the logo so far in this video, but I can't outright say it's a total disaster. And that's because of these flat stencils. This is genuinely really nicely done, in my opinion, and it works as the full diamond, just the stacked version, and even, controversially, the horizontal variant. That said, the less said about the textured version of the horizontal logo, the better. They need to stop using it and put it out of its misery. May I suggest killing it with fire? It would be a kindness. Whoever redesigned this is genuinely clever. They ran into problems with the original logo and really figured out smart ways to break it down for modern implementation. The Doctor arch is much more clean and precise. The font, still Futura bold, is smaller than its 1973 counterpart, allowing for equal negative space around the letters and making each letter much more legible. Also, they removed this nasty little tangent where the leg of the R meets the edge of the arch. Each letter is aligned on the same plane, with the bar of the T extended and the curve of the C elongated. This was probably done to help with legibility, or at least an aesthetic touch, helping each letter of the word Doctor appear an equal width. All the while, the arch plate itself is now a perfectly symmetrical shape. The Who is now bolder than before and continues to be the centerpiece of this design. The double stroke around the letters W, H and O enable it to retain that 70s blockiness while leaving the central letters at its core to be individual shapes. Best bet is, lose the diamond shield and boom, the new stacked variant. It looks vastly superior as this flat stencil. I don't understand the insistence on using the skewomorphic render, especially when originally the version of the target novels would be recolored to complement the cover art on which they appeared. Interestingly, however, some variants of the stencil stack have this little taper over the O, leaving me with the impression that someone took the full logo into Photoshop and just erased the diamond portion but forgot about this bit. One might argue that this is intentional flair, but then why not reflect that above the W? No, I think it's a mistake, especially as DWM uses a version where the taper is conspicuous by its absence. I know some people rail against flat graphic design. Such folks tend to bemoan the simplification of logos. A backlash always swells after an Instagram or Pringles goes for an overtly flat graphic logo, as if complexity and three-dimensionality must equate to better technical, stylistic superiority. It's the age-old argument of fine art versus classical paintings, but for the age of the brand. Surely you can see the benefits and versatility of using the stencil logo over its muddy, noisy 3D counterpart though, right? The colours can be changed to reflect the environments in which it's placed. It can work on cinematic or entirely graphic promotional material. And being a vector image, it's infinitely scalable. Now, in fairness, we know the primary logo must be a high resolution too, so it can be printed on large billboards and drapes. But what about the other way? What happens when we make it small? When you make a complicated image small, it loses clarity. And if your complicated image is a shape made up of a few dull colours, all of which are a similar dark value with noisy aberrations, it quickly goes from legible to illegible to an awkward blue blob. Why then put that tiny blue blob on a similar blue background? Why is this your social media presence, Doctor Who? Why not use the stencils for these profile pictures? Is it because you produce the primary logo in such a way that it dictates your colour choices and now you're stuck with it? This was the beauty of the insignias. The DW TARDIS and the Who Circle were simple and clean little stamps. Sure, the social media team is using the stencil of the full diamond logo in this capacity, but even this, when scaled down, is a little visually noisy. Hell, why isn't it just the stacked stencil? Is it because you'd lose the precious diamond? It all comes back to that shape. A shape that, may I remind you, was picked purely for the context of the title sequence in which it originally appeared. Something that we are yet to discover about the new logo's context in the next title sequence. Now, I must warn you, what I am about to show you might shock and disgust you. Those of a weak disposition are urged to leave the room. Children, avert your eyes. Avert them! The new diamond logo is not 
a diamond. <clears throat> yeah, the infamous diamond logo is no longer a simple geometric shape. But why? As stated a few times before, the word who is the central landmark of this logo. The W is at least five times the size of the D, for example. So why not take a diamond shape, the word mark for who, and use the alignment buttons to centre the design? Looks fine, right? Well, maybe at a quick glance, but the more you look at the logo, the more it looks off. Something janky is going on here. It's like when you see a face you know well, but flopped. All the asymmetry that you don't normally notice suddenly leaps out at you. The word who appears to be drifting to the right of the shape. There's a lot more negative space to the left of the W than the right of the O. And H, being such a perfectly symmetrical shape, means we can tell it's not aligning with the centre of the diamond. A fact that's only exacerbated when you add the inner piping to the diamond. What's causing this? Well, the word who. Who is such an ugly word. I mean, it can be, visually, if taken as a graphic shape. Let me explain. Each letter is vertically symmetrical, but vastly different in width. O is wider than H, and W is wider than O. So, unless you stylize or kern the text in a specific way, the center of the H can never be the center of the word. This wasn't such an issue on other logos, mostly because they lack a frame around the logo, meaning your eye doesn't register the lopsidedness. And New Who did away with the stacking altogether, so everything flowed from left to right organically. For the original version of this logo in 1973, Bernard Lodge aligned the H of Who with the vertical centre of the diamond, and then nudged the Who down so it was below the horizontal centre. I assume this was done to not only set the word Who in place, but also keep the logo from looking top heavy once the Doctor arch was added. But that logo was still designed in a perfect diamond shape. Why has the new one mutated like that? Allow me to introduce you to the optical centre. Even though we have access to computers which allow us to position things at perfect zero or space text perfectly evenly, it doesn't mean that that will look right to our eyes. In fact, it could become a headache for our flesh brains to understand. It's a sort of uncanny valley, but for visual communication. Finding the optical centre is basically eyeballing a design so it looks right, rather than being empirically correct. I'm sure there's a metaphor here for human art versus AI generated art, but I'm too busy talking about a JPEG I don't like. So ultimately, it's an optical illusion. If I break the logo down into boxes, we see that the space above and below who is identical. I think this is the reason behind extruding the decal on the shield, to ensure the space above and below who are pretty much equal. With the who being as big as it is, the designers were able to treat the edges of the diamond as separate shapes. They were then able to scale them independently of the main shield, creating the visual illusion of a contiguous shape that looks much more refined than its 1973 counterpart. And indeed, this design philosophy carries over to the stencil version. This is what I mean when I say this logo has been really nicely overhauled. This is very ingenious design work. It might be hard for us to unsee it now, but the general audience will probably never notice. But all that elegance and smart modernization is lost to this render. Isn't Doctor Who teaming up with Disney? The House of Mouse? There were so many new stories about a big cash injection. Couldn't the creative team in Cardiff afford to make this primary render look actually nice? Well, I have a theory. I think this rebrand was rushed. What's my evidence? The leak, of course. This logo originally leaked a few weeks before it was announced as part of the Disney Plus deal. Interestingly, even though the image is awfully compressed, it was labelled as the interim logo by the leaker. This was actually a phrase we'd heard used in regard to David Tennant's new incarnation before he regenerated into the 14th Doctor, which lent to the credibility of this leak. 
And if you look at the text in the top right corner of this image, despite poor image compression, that could easily say BBC Doctor Who interim brand outlines. Now this is conjecture on my part, so take it with as much salt as you feel comfortable, but I have a feeling this logo was conceived as a bridge logo for the 60th anniversary year, before more refined and unique branding could be devised for series 14 and beyond. However, something happened, perhaps not unlike the 2018 rebrand plan, and they had to double down on this. The fact the Disney Plus deal was announced with Shuti Gatwa in New York was when I knew this logo would be sticking around for the long haul. You don't often hold a press release with your new leading man alongside a temporary logo. And that's not all. The Doctor Who website is still happily chugging along, still using the design elements devised by Friendly Giants as part of the branding outlines for the 2018 logo. Remember these crystals? Well here they are, still on the website today for pop quizzes. And most egregious of all, look at that favicom. It's still the 2018 insignia. It's early days of course, the 60th anniversary advertising machine is still gearing up, so these things can be finessed as time moves forward. Also, yes, I know about the 60th anniversary literal diamond logo. Yes, it is actually a diamond, and yes, it's hideous. Although comically, the rendering on the Doctor and Who sections is much less egregious than on the primary logo. As mentioned, these are early days for this logo's use, but there is one place where it appears in all its skeuomorphic glory where it works. That reveal video. It's a 3D shape made up of metals reflecting the environment and colours it's in. It feels like it fell onto the desk of an animator who looked at the official primary logo and said, why is this glowing trim the colour of piss, before proceeding to make it a pleasing gold texture. The Who is a little smaller than on the primary logo. The Doctor nameplate is practically black, but the rim lighting picks out these highlights on the text clearly. Maybe it's just the setting of space, but there's no reflections on the piping causing distractive noise either. It might just be the YouTube compression, but why is the regeneration energy animating at a different frame rate to the logo? Sorry, sorry, this is definitely in the realm of nitpicking now, because this is genuinely a promising render. And if the primary logo looked like this, with brighter colours and lighting, I don't think I'd be here now, whinging for this long. As this video finally draws to a close, I've got mixed opinions. It's clear, a lot of care and ingenuity has been used to overhaul what is otherwise a goofy bit of graphic design, but this primary implementation is ugly as sin and feels oddly more like a ball and chain around the franchise than it is a powerful logo to unify under. Honestly, the return of the diamond logo is a shrewd, cynical choice cashing in on nostalgia with classic fans and older audiences by saying, why not check out this show again? You remember when it looked like this? You liked it then, didn't you? The implementation of the logo has been scattershot thus far, with very little in the way of a defining brand strategy. As I've been writing this, however, the publicity engine for the 60th has begun to gain traction, and there's some fun and interesting elements to these. There are ARG elements to keep the fandom engaged online, and we had those title reveals using the 2005 Vortex. I can't lie at the excitement I felt upon seeing those again. And hey look, big, bold, bombastic 3D title cards. It certainly is RTD2. We've also started to see some merchandise using what are potentially the new branding guidelines. This doesn't exactly scream kids fantasy adventure series, it's too stately and stale, like a jewellery item. The beige yellow is still horrible, and the return of the abandoned 2018 TARDIS illustration? I like seeing it again, but it gives this whole package in the feel of being chucked together from reused elements, and not in a nostalgic way. Perhaps more tellingly, the logo itself is just planted onto a white void on the box. This packaging has been designed to make the logo look good, rather than the logo supporting the product it's supposed to be selling. Hopefully this is just for the collector range as that's proper fan tat. There is still plenty of time for the branding to be fine tuned before Shooty's tenure really begins next year. 
As mentioned already, it's not like we haven't seen logos get refined and overhauled as tenures play out, and I think BBC Studios and Co would be missing a trick not taking note from the inventive and eye-catching interpretations fans have been toying with on Twitter. While you're on Twitter, actually, and I wouldn't make a habit of it, search the term Doctor Who logo whenever a new piece of news is announced about the ongoing production of the next series. It's accompanied with countless people seeing the new Diamond logo, presumably for the first time, and comparing it to the Paw Patrol logo. This is, of course, really funny to see, and honestly, I can understand where this association comes from at a glance. Same amount of letters as the primary focus of the logo. Same amount of letters in the arched plate. The metropolitan blue puts people in mind of the fuzz, comparable to Paw Patrol presumably being about first responder dogs. The poor lighting and texturing of the primary logo means people don't register the full rhombus shape of the shield, and only the bottom, presenting the same initial impression as Paw Patrol's police badge. The only real difference is that the Paw Patrol logo is categorically a much more appealing graphic than the primary Doctor Who logo. This fact seems to really upset Doctor Who fans, but unfortunately, this is what the general public see when they look at that logo. Public perception. Ah, oh, what a fickle thing. What of the man who created the original logo in 1973, Bernard Lodge? He's still with us! We don't know what he makes of the new logo, but DWN contributor Graham Kimball White has posted this image of the great man holding the new logo, so presumably there's an interview with him in a future issue of Doctor Who magazine. Meanwhile, Lodge himself is still creating art to this day! Check out his Instagram and website. He's making these awesome prints and I really want to get my hands on one. Listen, if you've made it all this way into a video on an incredibly esoteric subject and still like the new logo, then good on you. I hope you get a thrill from seeing it out and about. But I do hope you don't just like it because it reminds you of the past, but rather its own merits. Personally, I can take solace in knowing that in four to six years' time, there will be another change of logo. That is, if the last 18 years of New Who, or the entire history of the franchise, is anything to go by. And hopefully, the next one will be a little more to my taste. But until then, here we are. Doctor Who's Rhombus Logo. Rhombus Logo